Hello class, we are back for part two. We want to continue our discussion of the cell. I'm going to talk about mitochondria and then a topic I'm calling energy management. In other words, what happens when a cell doesn't have the energy it needs? What are all the things that can go haywire? So of course we start with learning objectives. What is the function of the mitochondria? What do they do? What's a brief description of glycolysis? Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. So we're just going to review that. We will talk about this in great detail in a future lecture, but just an overview. So then we can talk about what happens when a cell is flooded with oxygen. Uh, what happens when we produce free radicals and, and one der ones derived from oxygen that we call reactive oxygen species. How do they harm a cell? How do cells defend against um, uh, reactive ox oxygen species, or ROS. Um, another thing cells need energy for is to manage calcium. Why do we need to manage calcium, and what happens when a cell is hypoxic and can't manage its calcium? Uh, so one of the things that can happen is cells can die, and they can die by apopt apoptosis, or they can die by necrosis, and uh, we'll talk about those two processes as well. So energy metabolism. We have glycolytic enzymes in the cytoplasm, we have enzymes for the Krebs cycle or the TCA cycle in the matrix of the mitochondria. And then in the membrane cristae of the, of the mitochondria, there are proteins, uh, cytochromes, necessary for oxidative phosphorylation. So here we see a beautiful electron micrograph of a mitochondria. So it's got a double membrane. So there's a membrane on the outside. There's a little inner structure um, or a little inner space, and that space is where the hydrogen builds up um, from the electron transport chain, and then inside here is the matrix, and that's where the enzymes of the Krebs cycle is. So mitochondria make ATP. So out in the cytoplasm, we start out with a glucose molecule. Glycolysis is simply a series of reactions that use ATP to destabilize glucose, Glucose is then cut in half. You have two pyruvic acid molecules and a little bit of ATP that's produced. So that's uh, ATP production without oxygen. That pyruvic acid, and it also could be acetyl-CoA as we'll talk in future lectures, uh, that enters the mitochondria and goes through a series of reactions. First we take a carbon off. Notice when we take the carbon off we've got CO2 now. We produce a um, high energy compound, NADH, that's going to store the energy and then take it to the electron transport chain. We shuttle those molecules through the Krebs cycle. We break the bonds in the pyruvic acid. As we do, we remove a carbon that we exhale, and the energy in the bond we store in a short-term source that can go to the electron transport chain. The electron transport chain then shuttles electrons to make ATP the byproduct is CO2 and water, and then uh, oxygen has to be consumed in that process. Oxygen is the final electron acceptor. So it's important to realize that if a cell runs low on oxygen, uh, aerobic ATP synthesis stops. Uh, we will produce some lactic acid to try to keep glycolysis going, but there's a limit to that. And so there are lots of things that cells need ATP for. So if cells are hypoxic, they run out of ATP very rapidly. And so you can't make proteins, you can't pump ions, you can't um, contract muscles. A, high, a hypoxic heart cannot contract. A hypoxic skeletal muscle cannot contract. Um, and the, the, the most pressing thing is that hypoxic cells can't pump ions. And there are all sorts of consequences of that. Uh, another thing that happens um, with using oxygen is the production of free radicals. And uh, free radicals are molecules with an unpaired uh, electron in the outer shell. So I would like to take you back to our biochemistry presentation. I showed you a picture of superoxide. Superoxide has an unpaired electron in its shell. So superoxide is the mother of reactive oxygen species. And superoxide can be produced when cells are flooded with oxygen. Um, 
such as somebody b being given 100% oxygen inappropriately, or, um, or when, when oxygen returns to a cell after a period of, of hypoxia. So somebody has a tourniquet on and the cells have been hypoxic for a while, the tourniquet's taken off and all kinds of oxygen starts flooding back. Free radicals will be produced. We care because free radicals are reactive. They react with things and destroy them. They react with DNA and cause mutations. They react with proteins and inactivate them. They react with lipids and destroy cell membranes. So um, an example of a compound that leads to free radical production is peroxi uh, peroxide. So we have little uh, organelles and cells called peroxisomes with peroxidase. Um, and uh, those, that helps neutralize peroxide and, and, and uh, that sort of thing. The mitochondria also have enzymes that help us with free radicals. A very important mitochondrial enzyme is called superoxide dismutase, or SOD. There's some SOD in the, uh, in, in the cytoplasm, um, out in the blood, uh, but there's an important mitochondrial SOD. SOD. Um, so superoxide dismutase is an enzyme that neutralizes superoxide. So if you have a healthy mitochondria and healthy amounts of superoxide dismutase, when reactive oxygen species are produced, the mitochondria can handle it. But when mitochondria are stressed, they're not as able to handle free radicals, or there may be mutations in superoxide dismutase. Um, and there are all kinds of, of hypotheses and clinical trials going on to say, um, is Lou Gehrig's disease the result of uh, SOD mutation? There's a mouse model with a, with a superoxide dismutase mutation, and these mice exhibit a Lou Gehrig's type disease. Um, are are um, mutations of SOD implicated in colitis? So this, there's a lot of research and clinical trials taking place of if you give people superoxide dismutase or enhance that activity, uh, are there health-giving benefits? So. Here, uh, here's um, a number of things going on in this uh, slide. So here's a cell that's not receiving blood supply. So a low blood supply is ischemia. And if you're not getting blood, then you're not getting oxygen. That causes hypoxia. So you have less oxygen. Uh, if you don't have oxygen, then the mitochondria doesn't make ATP. Uh, and you can't synthesize. Uh, phospholipids um, and uh, free radicals are going to break down your phospholipids that can destroy the membrane um, uh, if you have low oxygen you can't run your calcium pumps calcium will build up you inappropriately activate enzymes that break down lipids that break down proteins um, cells can swell all sorts of things can happen uh, in addition uh, you get some inflammation, you recruit a white blood cell. White blood cells often in attack invaders by releasing free radicals. So we see peroxide, uh, we see a, a hydroxyl radical, and here we go, there's superoxide with its unpaired electrons. Then this can help destroy cells. So when a person is fighting infection, the white blood cells go after the invaders. Does the host get inflamed as well? Yes, they do. So um, managing reactive oxygen species or oxygen stress or oxidative stress, you see that a lot in the literature. That's what they're talking about. So here's an interesting situation in, involving something called repu um, reperfusion injury. So we have um, an enzyme called xanthase dehydrogenase, which is a perfectly nice enzyme. However, in under stress, periods of hypoxia, um, xanthase dehydrogenase becomes xanthase oxidize, uh, oxide, um, oxidase. And so um, uh, with periods of hypoxia, we're using up the ATP. ATP is broken up to ADP and then AMP and then adenosine and denison gets broken down to xanthase. All right, so the person's got um, 
had a heart attack and you give them clot busters therapy and now you uh, renew the blood flow to the heart muscle. Now all this blood with oxygen floods these cells and xanthine oxidase takes the xanthine and starts producing free radicals like you wouldn't believe and now you've reestablished blood flow but now the person has ventricular tachycardia because of the of all the free radicals. Um, now you had no choice. The person had a heart attack. They came to the ER. You had to give them um, a medication that broke down the clot. You had to replace the blood flow. But there are consequences to reperfusion, and that's dysrhythmias or cell death and that kind of thing. Now, a situation where you know there's going to be a hypoxia is bypass surgery. So somebody has um, coronary bypass, a surgery called cabbage. A person's on a heart-lung machine, and uh, there's a, an opportunity for hypoxia as the person goes from the heart-lung machine to their own heart supplying oxygen. So there's um, a preventative treatment that can be done. There's a drug called allopurinol. Allopurinol is a xanthine oxidase inhibitor. So when that person receives reperfusion after coming off the heart-lung machine, xanthase oxidase is inhibited. There's not this sudden production of free radicals and the person receives some protection from unwanted dysrhythmias as a result of bypass surgery. Um, so uh, so they're an interesting clinical scenario. Now lots of times there are emergency situations. You don't know that someone's going to be hypoxic, but someone scheduled for bypass surgery can be given this medication in advance because you know the surgery is taking place. Okay, I mentioned calcium a little bit ago. Calcium is supposed to be low. Inside your cell, calcium is maybe 100 nanomolar. Very teeny tiny amounts of calcium inside the cell. And why is that? Because calcium's reactive. When calcium comes into the cell, stuff starts to happen. You start to activate proteins. You start to contract. You, you turn on all kinds of enzymes. You turn on gene expression. Oh my goodness, all kinds of things happen. So calcium needs to be regulated. Sometimes you want it to be high, but when calcium is high when you don't want it to be high, it causes all kinds of problems. So we have mechanisms to keep calcium low. We have calcium pumps to pump calcium out of the cell. We have proteins that do that. So when you have hypoxia, you don't have the ATP to run your calcium pumps. You don't have a way to control calcium. Calcium starts to rise, you, inactivate, you, you activate enzymes inappropriately, which has dire consequences for the cell. And we all see, all see that here. Um, if you have uncontrolled calcium, uh, and that could be hypoxia, that could be free radicals, that could be some other issue. You start turning all kinds of enzymes. So you burn up your ATP, you break down your phospholipids, you break down your proteins, you break down your chromatin, and then you have a cell that's having difficulty functioning because of the uncontrolled calcium. Uh, uncontrolled calcium is an often final common uh, uh, death agent in terms of cells. So regulating calcium is very, very important for cell health. So cells can die. Um, when cells die in a programmed way, for example in, um, in fetal development, your heart is a long tube and then it folds around and then it's a four-chambered heart. Or you have little paddle hands and then you have apoptosis of the cells in between, so now you have individual fingers. Apoptosis is not a bad thing. Sometimes cells are supposed to die and get out of the way. Sometimes those cells die inappropriately because they're stressed out. Um, if you had a cancer cell and that cell committed cell suicide with apoptosis, that would help the organism survive. So there is a place for apoptosis. Uh, but sometimes when cells are overly stressed, you can activate apoptosis. Essentially what happens is you activate genes. These are genes that typically regulate growth and differentiation. And now 
with the activation of these genes in a, in a stressful situation, you activate a series of proteins called capsaices. These capsaices basically digest the cell from the inside out. And since everything is kept under cover of a membrane, uh, neighboring cells are not um, affected. Um, now that's very different from necrosis. So with necrosis, everything's unregulated. You have enzymes just going all over the place. The cell membrane breaks. You dump your contents on your neighbors. So you dump potassium on your neighbors and you make them all upset. And you develop, uh, dump inflammatory substances. So, so there's an inflammatory mechanism with necrosis that you don't see in apoptosis. So apoptosis can be normal. It's a genetically programmed process. At, a, at some point, the cell loses its cell markers, and the immune system can go in and finish the job because the cells basically stopped being part of the host. Um, so there are situations, say a person has a heart attack. The, the, the center of the heart attack, the cells die. Those, that's, those cells are dying by necrosis. There's an area around the area of infarction that's stressed. If the person can get to the hospital, if the person can get clot busters therapy and antioxidants and those sorts of things, um, and you stabilize that tissue, the tissue might be okay. Um, however, if the person doesn't get the appropriate health care, uh, maybe the tissue around gets so stressed it activates apoptosis and then you have a ring of additional cell death and then and then the area of infarction ends up being bigger um, than than it would have been originally so um, hence um, the emergence uh, the emer emergent nature of, of uh, heart attacks okay so we've talked about a lot of stuff there was a lot of pathophysiology here um, so you need to be able to go back to your um, learning objectives and tell me about basically what the mitochondria are doing and if you have hypoxia the mitochondria can't do their job um, and therefore we're running low on ATP that we're running low on our ability to manage calcium we're running low on our ability to manage free radicals and what dire consequences that has for the cell so I thank you very much for your attention Keep up the good work, and I'll see you in class.